Okay, this is the 7th of uh, July. Um, it's a Sunday afternoon about 5, going on 6 o'clock in the afternoon. We've had some really long rainy weather for, oh, two, three weeks and a whole lot of sun, sunshine. And in that time, the hive you see in front of you here is was a second swarm and this hive in the back between the two tomato plants was the first swarm and those two hives came out of this cypress hive here which is an Evans hive Evans cypress hive which is on the web and uh, I'm just going to go through them today and give them a check. Um, these three hives that you see here, this one, and the one that you see first, and this one, and this one were all started from package, um, two pound packages. And uh, this one over here has a experimental entrance device to keep um, hive beetles out and it works extremely well. I've modified it to use it on the middle super instead of the entrance down below which is closed. And it has a little drawer on the side which is filled with oil and the uh, beetles go in a certain way and uh, they end up in the oil. These two hives that you see here have a full full oil pan on the bottom board which uh, with a 1 8 inch screen on the top and they also work excellent for keeping the the hive beetles in check. I had a big problem with those at all since I changed my uh, bottom boards and entrances on some of the hives to which I've just told you. I made 10 of these that you see here and they are on my uh, YouTube video under G Wooster. That's G W O O S T E R. Should be able to find them. So I'm going to go dive into these and see what I find. Well, this is the second swarm hive um, that I referred to earlier and took a frame out just to see what was cooking and basically the super that you see here was uh, already extracted from another hive and I put it on here uh, wet to give them an extra super I'm running my hives now one deep and one medium for the brood chamber as opposed to two deeps because it's getting a little bit too laborious weight wise and they have basically filled this uh, very nicely and cleaned it up and filled it with nectar now so I figure another week or two at the, at the rate things are going now, and it'll probably be capped. Um, we've had a lot of rain, so they haven't been able to uh, be as uh, busy foraging as I'd like. So, uh, and again, this is a, this is a secondary swarm out of, the, of out of the same hive. Uh, surprisingly it was the same size weight wise or maybe a little larger than the first swarm which is unusual because uh, each succeeding swarm generally is smaller but that didn't seem to be the case I'm going to also check it just quickly to see if we have brood because last time I checked it which was about 10 days ago there was no brood in the queen which probably which was a virgin hadn't been mated so I'm going to do that now and see what's cooking Well, I'll try to try to show you what I'm looking at here, but this is a this is a, fr uh, a full frame of a brood that has uh, honey that's being capped around the top crescent here, and in the center you won't be able to see it. But uh, what I found is an area right in here which has got fresh eggs. So I know I have a, le a laying queen. So that solves my problem. Functional queen. 
Well, this hive is uh, uh, one deep and one medium for the brood chamber. And I have a queen excluder on this, which I don't generally use. And um, this is a deep, which is on top, which I don't usually use because I'm getting old and getting up there in years. And uh, when these things are filled, they're like 80 pounds or more. And uh, I gave them this about two weeks ago. And um, they haven't really moved up into the super, but they have filled the other two pretty much to max. So I think what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to take uh, the queen excluder off. I'm not really impressed with the queen excluders. I think they really limit the travel. If you give the queen enough room, which is a, a deep and a, and a medium, that should be plenty. So I'm going to just take that off right now and, get, and I'll get back with you. So as you can see, there's the deep on the ground. The queen excluder is there on the grass. I'm gonna just pull a frame up here. Uh, I know I'm bouncing this camera around and I don't generally do much editing because I don't have the time to waste with it. So you'll just have to bear with me. And by the way, you see this hive tool I'm using? If you don't have one, for doing your uh, examination inside the hive. This hook that you see on the end here really fits nice. If you look down here where I'm sticking it, here's the ledge that your your frame sit on right here. You want to put it right in front of that and see how it, it uses the, the other frame here as a fulcrum and you just pull up on it like that and it's so much easier than trying to pry it with a standard hive tool. I've got both but uh, See if I can do this one-handed here for these little bat babies. Kind of have to cheat a little. Pry the other side up. I don't want to get them ticked off unnecessarily. They're doing such a good job working today since we've had so much rain. Well, here you go. See, and I'll look down there at all those bees. They are just busier and, and than the dickens. So what we've got here is is a, a super that's really ready to be taken off. But rather than take it off now, since I've kind of packed my extractor up after uh, my uh, June and earlier um, honey flow, what I'm going to do is normally I would take this, this finished super and put it on top and put another one underneath it that's empty to be filled so that when I go to take the super off I'd have the, the most filled one on top. But what I'm going to do here if I did that, see the one I've got on top since I ran out of medium supers this year, got everything else on the hives in other places, that I'm afraid that since this one is a deep, they might have the queen move up into it. So rather than do that, I'll do that more toward the fall, say mid-August, so I got another six weeks or so to go. So I think they can fill this up with honey. So I'm going to leave it on top but without the excluder and that'll kind of discourage the queen from going all the way up there to fill it with brood because we'll have this medium here in between. So I'm going to assemble it back with like it was but without the excluder between the two to encourage them, the bees that is, the, queen, the, the, the workers to move up into this deep so they'll do a better job and won't waste their time trying to get through the slots in the excluder. So I'll be back in a bit. Well as I started to say before the camera shut off, uh, um, we've had a dearth of uh, nectar flow either because of the rain or because of the floral sources that haven't been around because of so much rain or the bees haven't been available to work them so uh, as soon as the sunshine comes out and starts being more of a regular thing daily we'll probably have the start of another nectar flow but this this final uh, package uh, that was installed this year in this particular cypress hive is my wife's and this is a 
uh, a little narrower, a little lighter frame uh, hive. It's an eighter, an eight frame instead of a ten, and uh, a little easier to work with. And this one's con uh, composed of uh, two mediums. One, two. I put an extra one on for honey flow, and I'm going to check it today to see if they're any different than the the, the two we just worked. Uh, had to make some modifications on this one uh, because of the roof and because of this special um, entrance I have on the front to keep the uh, hive beetle out. Now they have been very busy and as you can see since this is a new hive um, like I said, started this year. I'm gonna give you a give you a glimpse if I can. I have to pry with one hand as I hold the camera in the same hand and and move with the move. Sorry about that. Move with the other. So they're they're filling this uh, box up with 100%. Uh, honey nectar now, so a combination until it's all capped. So they're about five frames wide. They got another three to fill, so uh, I should have this done in a week or two, and I'll take this one off and put another one, put it after I extract it right back on, so uh, they're doing very, very well. I'm sure my wife will be happy when I tell her. And and there is the same hive that I just was working on my wife's garden hive. It's an eight frame wide uh, that I just showed you that had the top box uh, with a nice white sealed honey uh, with a with a copper top. Uh, she has been helping me in the bee yard, and I really appreciate her effort. And she's <laughs> getting used to bee stings, sort of, and. Uh, doesn't like that of course when it happens but it happens but she's been a real trooper and she said she wanted her own hive so I bought this uh, hive for her from Brushy Mountain and uh, I'm really proud of her she's done a great job and looks like the good Lord is going to bless her with some with a nice box of honey that she can do with as she pleases you know she doesn't like to read bee books, I can tell you that much, but she does kind of learn from the the beekeeper, that's me, and uh, if that's the way it works for her, I guess that's okay. But to give you an idea, and there's the front of this hive, and I put that one on a couple of uh, stones uh, that you'd use in your patio, that sort of thing, and leveled them off, and then and built a hive stand, and painted it kind of a darn a dark brown to match the siding on the uh, trim on our house. Uh, and that's that special entrance I talked about that keeps the beetles out. It seems to work very good. And of course it has a full screened uh, bottom board um, which does a nice job to keep them cooler. Because if they had just that small entrance I'm sure and there would be a heat issue eventually as the weather warmed up and we're getting some 90 degree days coming up so it's going to be not a problem. So I've got one final hive here in the backyard then I have one more on the deck so we'll go to this one next. So we have opened this one that I just said was the last one in the yard and we'll check and see what's cooking in here. They've been busy this this hive has been very busy since it uh, since it was the the first swarm, and they filled their brood chamber up in less than a week with honey pollen, and the queen was laying right off the bat. And now I gave them this box here, which is the second medium super on here and really what I call my first honey super since my brood chambers have been running uh, a, sh a shell, a, a medium and a deep and what it looks like is we we have the beginnings, I don't know if you can see it because of the light but I'll 
I'll have to review this later, but this was a, a super that I had already extracted and I gave it to him wet. And what it looks like is we have just the early beginnings of uh, nectar deposit and uh, they clean that super all up and, and it looks like it's going to be filled probably two to three weeks from now. Um, so they're doing very well. Uh, better really than I had hoped so things are coming along. Oh, and in case you wonder what this thing is, I'll just give you a little side shot. It's facing the sun, and that's when I put all my burr comb, all my cappings in um, from my uh, extracting. Um, after uh, the honey has been taken out of them, um, and then that falls into a pan obviously at the bottom and they, I take that rough uh, first solar extracted wax and I collect it over a period of time and then eventually I throw all that stuff that's been collected like that into some boiling water over a camp stove outside not inside or in any contained area because it's dangerous when you start boiling water with wax in it and you do that at a slow boil and controlled boil until all the wax is melted in the water and then it's a matter of leaving it, turn the heat off and leaving it alone until all the wax which is now liquid on top of the water settle, uh, cools and solidifies and then you just take that pan in after it's nice and cool and everything's been solidified and you pour all the water out and pop that solid cap of wax off the what was the water and out of the pan and then what you see is a nice round uh, wafer however thick could be anywhere from a half inch clear up to uh, almost filling the pan depending upon of course how much wax you had in there and then what you have to do is kind of wash the slum gum or crud off the bottom of the wafer or slice it off with a knife depending upon how thick it is and now you have a finished wax uh, wafer if you will um, that you can collect and use for sale slash trade slash swap for foundation that sort of thing or do what you will make candles so now we're going to go up here on the deck and do the final one and this is my cypress hive next to my gazebo and here's my back door on the patio so and here's a flower pot right next door so it gives you an idea this is just a regular residential backyard I only planned on having three hives here now I'm up to six so I'm gonna move some of these out I'll take the lid off of here and show you what else is kind of unique about this hive When I work my hives, I always put the cover on the ground, and that becomes the rest um, for any boxes that you want to take off, so you don't mash the bees that are on the bottom. Now, this is a, kind of an easy view. I forget exactly what it's called, but it's on the internet, both on YouTube and I think they have their own website, the guy that sells these. This is a combination feeder as you can see you can have at least three feeders in here quart bottles I'm not using it now as that I'm just using it as a gauge or barometer if you will or thermometer to tell me how the bees in this particular area are doing from the standpoint of activity and this is the hive that had the two swarms that I talked about earlier um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this gizmo off the top as you can see I'm doing right now and they did a nice job sealing it up for me and put it down here out of the way and again instead of having 
two deep brood bodies as I've always had. This is a cypress hive and it is one deep, I'm pointing, one deep here and then a medium, another medium and another medium. So I've got three mediums on the top. So the, the cypress part basically is what I prefer to call my my new uh, formatted brood chamber. Instead of being two deep, it's one and a half. We'll call it one and a half deep. And so your medium holds about uh, oh, 30, 30 pounds of honey when it's filled, if you use it as a honey super or box. And there's a shallow which holds about 20, 20, 20 to 25. Again, it depends on how heavy the bees work it and whether you have 10 frames in there or 9. I generally put nine, which allows my honey supers to be filled out deeper or wider, if you will, and that makes them easier to uncap. So I generally have spacers in there for nine frames. This one is an exception, I think. Let's see, three, six, nine, ten, yeah. So this one was already extracted and was put on here wet. Uh, and as you can see, those are coming up with the others, so there's probably not a lot of nectar in here. It's probably just the beginnings. And so we'll just check it again to see if they're bringing in anything. This is actually a shallow, not a medium. And there is no honey in here, but it's all cleaned up and ready to be used for uh, depositing nectar and, and curing it into honey. So, uh, like I said, there appears to be a dearth in on right now or a lack of flow for whatever reason so I assume as things pick up agriculturally around the area that will that will change uh, in the next several weeks preferably with more, less rain and more uh, sunshine so I've checked all the hives they all have good laying queens um, they're all working very nicely so I'm very satisfied so of the of the hives that are back here, this is the only original hive that was on this deck. The others that were here have been moved to an outyard, and this one has supplied me with two swarms, which I showed you in in the pre uh, previously in this uh, video, and they're doing exceptionally well. So this gave me a 200% gain. Uh, it will have some lag time because of the bees that left, but. It appears to be full of bees now, so I don't think it's going to be a big loss. Um, and then the three packaged hives that I showed you in this same video, and they're doing extremely well. So I figure it minimally, this this hive here will give me close probably to, like it always does, 100 pounds of, ho of honey before it's shut down for the year, for, for winter. And each of the others that are new starts will give me a minimum of 30. Um, so... Uh, three fives are 15, that's 150 pounds plus uh, another 100, so 250 pounds out, out of these, which are, with the exception of this, are first, uh, first year hives, so not too bad. Uh, so that is the final check. I've got a couple of out yards I'll have to go to either tomorrow or the next day. I had to replace a couple of queens. Uh, that were lagging and or missing for whatever reason so they became queenless and and uh, one I had to treat as though it was a laying worker so I had to shake the bees some distance from uh, from where they were originally and to make sure that they'd accept the new queen. Both queens that I replaced are marked which will make them kind of uh, easy identify. So in summation what we have here is just a kind of a walk through after uh, about a 10 day period just to see how these hives are doing. Uh, no, no real surprises other than the fact that uh, they all have active queens and they're all got a good brood pattern. Uh, there's no honey flow or nectar flow I should say at the present time of any consequence but that will change as it always does. Um, last year we had nine hundredths of an inch over uh, May 6th, about August.
uh, 6th though. Uh, I still averaged over 120 pounds per uh, hive that was uh, was not uh, a new hive, so um, did very well last year, which was a shock considering the lack of water. So I think the soybeans and slash corn probably came in and and uh, saved the day from the standpoint of pollen and and nectar, even though. Corn pollen is not a really good source of protein for bees, and most of the time when they get a better source, they'll haul it out of the hive and get rid of it. But anyways, you've had a, a look at what I do and what I look for and what I think about when I work a hive or hives. Um, so if it helps uh, in your education about bees, I hope I've been able to give you some more information. Um, Generally, when you're working a hive, you look for behavior patterns. Uh, a hive that's in good working order, meaning a, a, a functional queen, um, nectar coming in, that sort of thing, um, they behave passively, basically. They don't get too riled up. You use a little bit of smoke and keep them under control. A hive that doesn't have a queen is a stagnant hive. Um, could have a laying worker, could have disease, could have all kinds of possibilities. So you want to make sure you spend some time and find out what's really cooking there. And that means you've got to open go all the way down to the bottom board and look at all your boxes and make sure that you, you know what you're looking at. Does, does, does it have a bunch of drone cells in it? You know, do you have a laying worker? Or do, do you see any regular brood? And that means if you don't, you probably don't have a functional queen. Or if she is, she's really on the failing side big time. If you see spotty brood, I mean, it usually means you have a functional queen, but she needs to be replaced. And just like the previous statement, that one would be need, needed to be replaced. But if you have a laying worker, or you think you do, then you have to treat it the hive a little bit different because it would be harder to get rid of the laying worker. They would probably kill any queen that you try to introduce. That being said, you have to follow the rules for laying workers when you when you pre prep the hive before you introduce the queen or she will be killed most likely so that's a little bit more of a test of your uh, of your savvy with bees when you try to get rid of a laying worker so bone up on the literature before you try it so you know basically what you need to do as you get busy with that particular hive but all these hives fortunately are not a problem and if you want to learn more without messing with the bees so much because you set them back every time you open the hive by about three or five days depending on what you're doing you can get one of these gadgets I think they run about I don't know thirty five forty dollars but they're kind of fun and uh, they don't show you everything you'd like to see in a hive but they do let you uh, get kind of a feeling for what's going on as you see there's not a whole lot of bees in the top here and what they're basically doing is they're sealing this area, these areas up where there's cracks with propolis and so they're working there's a big old fat drone here you know that you can see flying around on top because there's a little more room than you normally have and they might have a tendency they did have a piece of burr comb here that I took out so you know it kind of gives you a quick look and if this hive were to be really stuffed with bees and ready to swarm what you'd see is this whole area would be filled with bees and that's what we had prior to the swarm. I really wasn't worried about swarming so much as I was that, that it would leave the area and I might not be able to, to get it. It happened that I saw one swarm and my wife saw the second swarm. One landed in the cherry tree and one landed in the grape in the in the vineyard so uh, in the arbor, grape arbor. So as it turned out, we got lucky with both, and both queens are present, and both queens are laying, and that's a good thing. So that's about it for this uh, look at what, what's going on in the hives. Hope it's helped, um, and keep an eye on what I have to say in my uh, other um, videos on uh, related matters as it, as it pertains to bees. I'll get you later. Bye-bye. So now what you're looking at is, uh, just as a bonus, we'll say, for the end of this video, um, there's 
two pans down here, two pans full. These are bread pans, okay, that I use to fill, pour the wax in. Um, and then I use a big pan that looks like this, see? And see how nice and clean it is? And that's after I put it on a camp stove and put some water in the bottom up to about a third. And then pour all this wax that I've used, uh, that I've taken out of my solar extractor and collected. And it can have bees in it. Uh, it can have a little bit of, uh, on occasion, a, a little bit of honey. And uh, you put it on here and you put it on the can stove and you turn on the burner and you let it come to a, a very slow rolling, not rolling, but a slow boil. Because um, you keep, once you get it, the water hot enough, you want it to just melt all the wax. And when the wax is all melted, you kind of stir it all up as this is doing to kind of increase the surface area and help the melting process. And once that's all liquid, you just turn the burner off and let this whole thing just cool down, usually overnight. And that will all solidify. And then when you take it out, it looks like this. So this one was just done, okay? This, this represents the cappings from this year's uh, harvest of uh, something like 13 boxes of honey so far. And this is early in the year. So this was like May and June. Uh, maybe the last of April. So a combination of things like basswood and honey locust, black locust, honeysuckle, that sort of thing. This is the wax that came from that that flow. This is last year's, this is last year's, and these two are last year's. Last year's uh, total was something like close to eight, uh, 760 pounds uh, out of, uh, I think, five hives. And that included uh, uh, one box of uh, honey from a, a gal's hive that I'm kind of taking for because she got kind of disinterested in doing the work herself. So there was one box, I think, that came off of that or one in a partial box. So she doesn't want anything done but the very very natural and you know she doesn't like her bees taken care of uh, if they're a little hungry in the spring she'd rather let them starve to death and that really sets them back so I don't believe in that type of management it's not nice for uh, things like that to go on in the beehive so think of yourself as being forcibly starved just because you want to keep things in a certain way that's not the way to do it that's not organic uh, beekeeping either. So, not as far as I'm concerned. Uh, sugar is natural. Uh, corn syrup is not. So, hey, make some wise choices what you use in your hive. It's up to you. But uh, we're having enough problems with bees without uh, compounding it with stupidity. So, that's just my two cents worth. But uh, I don't do things. That are not re that are not productive or not uh, reasonable from the standpoint of the bees' health or their welfare. So, there kind of gives you an idea how I how I do uh, my beeswax uh, from the standpoint of my uh, yearly endeavor and after after it's processed, what it looks like. Um, what do I do with this? Uh, whatever I want to basically, which could be anything from using it in carpentry to making candles. But most of the time I'll save it and trade it in um, for a foundation. Um, I don't use a lot of chemicals uh, other than what's naturally found in the hive, so um, I like to have foundation made out of mine. Uh, so that I have, don't have a lot of chemicals locked up in the beeswax, which is another good reason to keep your own beeswax if that's what you're doing in your hives. And also, you should be probably culling about 20% of your frames, the old, dark, oldest frames you have in your boxes, should be culling those out and replacing them with newer frames and newer wax, because that becomes a, a depository for chemicals which are everywhere you cannot get away from them regardless of where you put your bees because uh, bees fly to places you can't imagine and they bring back things that you don't want to talk about so 
that's a reality. But you can help matters by um, changing the methods of how you do beekeeping and how you keep your hives. Commercial beekeepers can't afford to do what I'm talking about, plus they deal with chemicals on a very personal level and a very close level. So their hives are polluted, whether we like to think about it or not. And you can start with an almond, grower, al almond growers where you have a million hives at least, a million five maybe every year, brought in there to pollinate almonds. So this is a serious issue and might be one of the key points on why we're having such problem problems with our bees now because there's a serious issue whether people want to believe it or not but it is an issue that the insecticides have become part of our daily lives and they're not being managed reasonably um, from the standpoint of the people who apply them and other individuals who interact with them even the homeowner because now systemic poisons like the neonics or the neonicotinoids are being used by even households in some areas so it's going to become a bigger problem before somebody wakes up but hey that's my two cents worth uh, this is the end of this video and uh, I'll see you in the future thanks for watching